Thank you for being here. We've had good crowds all morning and good lessons all morning. We're glad to have Denny Freeman speak to us about the problem of radical individualism. He was converted in Baltimore in the early 70s. He came here to school, and I know he won the Upper Division Bible Award when I was first, first here and uh, as a student. And Denny has preached in several places over the last 35 to 40 years. I can remember him telling me the story several years ago of seeing an article when he lived in Pennsylvania, seeing an article uh, in the paper about a person saying they were dissatisfied with their congregation, uh, people not preaching the Bible and teaching the Bible. He made contact with them. And through that contact, converted 16 people. Uh, Denny has always been deeply concerned about lost souls. That leads him to do his evangelism uh, and prisons now in northeast Florida as well as local preaching. And we are thrilled to have Denny with us and speaking about the problem of uh, radical individualism. Well, I didn't expect that. It's nice to have uh, Tommy introduce me like that. Um, haven't seen much of him for several years. It's really wonderful to be able to be with uh, each other again. And so many of you, this place is awfully important to me. And I know that it is to you too. That's why you're here this week. It's just amazing when you stop and think about all the lives that have been touched for, through all, throughout all the many, many years, all the good that has been done here at Florida College. I appreciate so much the devotion and dedication on the part of so many men and women who work here, some of whom have been here for a long time. Uh, I appreciated tax list of teachers and, uh, that, at whose feet he was able to sit when he was here at Florida College years ago, and I would add uh, Phil Roberts to that list. I remember I had so many classes with Phil, and I remember one time that he, uh, he was having us read just about everything in the library, I think, <laughs> in preparation for one of our classes, and after we were just completely overwhelmed, intellectually with what we were trying to absorb from him he held up his finger and he said remember don't forget to read the text and i've held that in my mind kept that with me for a lot of years i think what he was trying to impress upon our minds was all the reading that you do all the studying that you will do now and for the rest of your life is done in an effort to gain greater understanding of what god has said to us and everything that we do should be in an effort to gain a greater understanding of what God has said to us. I hope I can do some of that here this morning. I appreciate so much what Tag just said. Uh, the two men before me have laid a good foundation, I think, and I'm going to try to build on it. Tag uh, contacted me a while back while we were still preparing our lectures for the book. He sent me an email and he said, hey, when's your lecture? And I said, Tuesday morning at 11 o'clock. And he said, that's great. I'm speaking at 10 o'clock. I'll be your warm-up act. <laughs> and I'm thinking now, he doesn't warm things up. He burns down the house. <laughs> but he's always done that. That's why we appreciate him so much. And uh, it's a pleasure to follow these brothers and just to be a part of this. It's humbling that I've even been, been invited to be here and to be a part of this. So I thank everyone so very much for this opportunity. Well, you know that uh, in a general way, the theme this year has to do with marriage and family. And in particular, we are talking about all of the things that Satan has been busy doing in an effort to destroy marriage and the family as God has designed it. And this morning we're talking about various things that we as human beings can become preoccupied with that are negative, that will only harm us in our families and in our marriages. And uh, this morning, specifically, I'm dealing with today's preoccupation with self. 
And I guess the first thing I would say about that is simply this, that as human beings, we have been preoccupied with that for a very long time. Adam had to have had a little self-preservation in mind when he attempted to shift the blame for his own disobedience and place it on the only other human being on the planet at that time. And she happened to be his wife. And I think human beings have been concerned about self-preservation and our own self-interest ever since. Had Adam known that, or had he not known that he was guilty, I don't think he would have attempted to find a tree big enough to hide behind. And let me just tell you, that's impossible. If you're running from God, you'll never find a tree big enough to hide behind and to hide from God. But it's just astonishing to me that the very first human being was concerned only about himself. And we haven't fixed that problem. We're still working on it, this problem of selfism. But I am thankful to God that he has given to us the compass of his word that will lead us out of the woods of selfism and will take us to a place, a spiritual place, where God will teach us selflessness if we are willing to listen to what God has to say. This place is identified quite simply by the Apostle Paul as in Christ. And in Christ... We learn the beauty and the power of being selfless. We live in such selfish times. It is truly amazing. Oh, the bitter pain and sorrow that a time could ever be. When I proudly said to Jesus, all of self and none of thee. Yet he found me. I beheld him bleeding on the accursed tree. And my wistful heart said faintly, some of self and some of thee. Day by day, his tender mercy, healing, helping, full and free, brought me lower while I whispered less of self and more of thee. Higher than the highest heaven, deeper than the deepest sea, Lord, thy love at last has conquered none of self and all of thee. It's not an easy journey from self to selfless. The Bible is replete with stories for us to read about men and women who, some of whom, at least at times in their life, were were very selfish and very self-absorbed. Some of them learned through the teaching of God to get themselves out of that and how to become selfless. I preached not long ago on Genesis 16 and the story of Abram and Sarai. And I love reading that chapter. If you want to read about dysfunction in family, read what goes on in the tent of Abram. In chapter 16 and verse 5, after Sarai had concocted the scheme, she was the one that hatched the plan to have Hagar go in to her husband and bear children since she was unable to do that. After all of that, she comes to Abram, and when the tension in the air is so thick you could cut it with a knife, and she comes to her husband and says, may the wrong done me be upon you. In other words, this is your fault. I think had I been Abram on that occasion, I would have said something like, honey, let's think about this for a minute. Can we talk about this for a minute? May the wrong done me be upon you. Hagar had hated her at that point, and I think the thing was working its way to the point where Sarai was going to hate Hagar. And so then in the very next verse, Abraham says, or Abram at that time, he says to his wife, she's still under your authority. Do what is right in your own eyes. In other words, okay, dear, whatever you think, And God has those things, not just for the purpose of filling in Israelite history for us, but primarily for the purpose so that we can look into their lives and we can learn. There was a lot of selfishness 
in that family and in the children to come from them and the children that came from them. And we learn that the way of selfishness is a hard way. The picture that is painted for us in words in the Old Testament, uh, in the Old Testament about Judah and Tamar, what a story. Isaac, very smart man, sometimes too smart for his own good. Laban, talk about a man who had his own best interests at heart. Israel's children in the wilderness. Haman, who was hanged on the gallows that he himself had built. God's elect during the time of the prophets in the Old Testament, a prophet named Jonah. And on the list goes of people who were, again, at least at times during the course of their lives, more concerned about self than they were about others and more concerned about self than they were about God. And then we read about people like Joseph and Ruth and Joshua and Elisha and Samuel, Peter, James, and John, who I consider to be three individuals who, through the teaching of the Lord, found their way from selfism to selflessness. I don't mind telling you the one person who has gotten in my way and has hindered me in my spiritual walk more than anybody else in my life is me. We say sometimes so-and-so is his own worst enemy. Oh, isn't that true? And oh, how it affects our marriages and our families. If this were not true of all of us, I suppose that the Apostle Paul would not have had to write what he did in Philippians chapter 2. You know the passage, but I want to read Philippians chapter 2, verses 2 through 5. Paul says, Make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Now listen to verse 3. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. But with humility of mind, let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. You tell me if that's not one of the most difficult things we can pursue in life. Why is that? Because we have our own interests at heart. It is a part of human nature. And it goes all the way back to the garden. Verse 4, do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, which I think means selfishly held on to. So he let go, and he came here, and he lived among us. And he gave us the ideal and the perfect example of how life can be lived for others in that everything he said and did was for others. How contrary that is to the world in which we live today. Self-love and selflessness are mutually exclusive. In the Bible, they are polar opposites. But I'll tell you, brethren, the difference between the two is rather blurry and somewhat confusing in our social media today. Go home and get on your computer and plug into your browser self-love. And you'll just be amazed at what comes up. A lot of religious people go online and they write about self-love. And by the time they're finished, there really is no difference whatsoever between the love of yourself and the love of other people. In fact, a lot of people are going to say, and some of them even quote scripture, are going to say that you can't love anyone else until you can love yourself. There may be a kernel of truth in that. But you'll find that what most people are saying and the conclusions that most people in our world today are drawing from that have nothing to do with God, with what God is saying to us in Scripture. The Bible is very clear on the distinction between self-love and selflessness in an effort to 
to get at that distinction and do so with clarity, I, I want to make an analogy. The expression rich man in the Bible does not describe merely somebody who is wealthy in material goods. Rich man in the Bible is an expression that describes somebody who is in love with his riches. Read what Jesus had to say about the rich man. What James says about the rich man in the book of James. What the Proverbs uh, say and other Old Testament passages say about the rich man. And so in the same way, self-love, the very concept of self-love in the Bible is not merely an appreciation of the fact that we are beings created in the likeness of God. God don't make no junk, which is true. But it's more than that. The Apostle Paul identifies it in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 2 where he says, For men will be lovers of self. That's not a good thing. It's not just an appreciation of how God created me and my makeup as a human being. It's couched in a context of horrible sins. Men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers. You go down through the list and you, I think, will have to come to the conclusion that if we were not first and foremost lovers of self, none of those other things would even follow. Selfism. Radical individualism. You read the lecture in the book, I hope that you will. There's a lot of uh, things that I've tried to written that explain that from a philosophical standpoint and the history behind it. I want to be practical in what I have to say to you today, as practical as I can. But this is what it's about. It is a matter of human pride. C.S. Lewis said, pride is the complete anti-God state of mind. And even though we've not really addressed specifically the family, we can understand that selfism is an evil working principle affecting and infecting all of us. No one is immune. And it's not just, quote, immoral. Harry and Sandy Chapin wrote a song many years ago that some of us remember called Cats in the Cradle. Try to recall those lyrics in your mind. It, what, what you have is a father who was so absorbed in his own self-interest that he missed the birth of his son. He wasn't there when his son was taking his first steps because he had things to do and bills to pay and planes to catch. And he missed that. He buys a toy for his son. When his son is 10 years old, he buys him a ball. And so naturally, his boy says, Dad, can you play with me? No, I can't. He's too busy. And then one day, his son comes home from college and the lyric is, so much like a man, I just had to say, son, I'm proud of you. Can you sit for a while? He shook his head and he said with a smile, what I'd really like, dad, is to borrow the car keys. Can I have them, please? I've long since retired and my son's moved away. I called him just the other day and I said, I'd like to see you if you don't mind. He said, I'd love to, dad, if I could find the time. You see, my new job's a hassle, and the kids got the flu. It's sure nice talking to you, Dad. It's been sure nice talking to you. And as I hung up the phone, it occurred to me that he'd grown up like me. My boy is just like me. Even those of us who have named the name of Christ can fall into this trap and get so busy with our own self-interest that our children are being hurt, our marriage is being hurt, and God is calling us to his word to come back to him and learn what it means to serve others and to put self last. It's difficult. 
it calls us to do things that run counter to a big part of our human nature. And sometimes it is very moral. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verses 19 and 20, which are really the key verses here and the verses that were given to me as uh, a way of uh, summation of what I'm saying here this morning concerning individualism and selfism. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 19, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? And then in verse 20, Paul says, For you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. You are not your own. You have been bought and purchased by the blood of Jesus. And I think in these two verses, Paul is explaining to us that not only has our everlasting soul been bought by the blood of Jesus, but our body has as well. Because after all, that's the only way that we give animation to the soul that we have, at least for a while. And so Christ has purchased us. We belong to him. We are not our own. And it's interesting that what follows in 1 Corinthians in chapter 7 in the first five verses have to do with marriage. And Paul is explaining to husband and wife there are responsibilities that you have to each other. Be loving and tender with each other. Understand that uh, the sexual relationship is a gift from God and it is one of the most beautiful things that we can enjoy in this life when it is enjoyed within the confines of God's word. Paul is teaching there. Paul is saying be careful if you don't listen to what God is saying about that. Your eyes can wander and you can wander and find yourself in a situation that is going to be devastating to your marriage. So what do we remember is the foundation of all of that. You are not your own. God has bought you with the precious blood of Jesus. Selfishness, selfism, individualism wreaks havoc in our families. I had a young man, I've been working in the prison system in Northeast Florida for the last 12 and a half years, though now I'm working, uh, doing located work again as of the first of this year. But uh, those of us who have worked there have met hundreds of men and worked with hundreds of men. And there's a young man that called me on the phone three or four weeks ago, maybe. And uh, he said, Denny, I need some advice. Can I come over and see you? And I said, sure you can. And he came over and he plunked himself down in the couch in our living room and he looked right at me and the first words out of his mouth were, well, Denny, I'll just tell you right now, it's a woman. And I said, Joe, not his real name, I knew it was a woman when you called me on the phone and asked for advice. Because 99 times out of 100, that's what's going to happen to a man who is still fairly fresh out of prison and he's trying to find his way. He's just been converted to the Lord while in prison and he's trying to find his way in Christ. And he told me, and I quote his exact words. He said, having sex with her made me so close to her that it's killing me now to break it off. And when he said that, I thought to myself, well, that's exactly what Paul is saying in chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians and verse 16. Do you not know that the one who joins himself to a harlot is one body with her? For he says the two will become one flesh. I don't believe that Paul is saying that as soon as you have sex with someone else, that it is a marriage has occurred that requires commitment. I don't think Paul is teaching that at all here. But I think Paul is teaching what Joe was saying to me. Everything changed when we engaged in sex together. I'm so close to her now. This is killing me to break it off, but I know it's wrong. She's married. I know that I have no godly right to this woman. I know that he said, I know that. But what he said to me was, I wanted to pleasure myself. And so we did. And she did. And now they're both suffering 
terribly because of it. I was so glad that he was seeking advice, though, and I think is working his way out of that. But how difficult things can be when we pleasure self and ignore what God has said to us. In previous generations, moral choices were made by informed reading and application of Scripture. But our pro-choice, me, 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 I have my truth, you have yours generation, is so biblically illiterate, most people couldn't tell you what the Bible says about human relationships, let alone what Scripture says about the salvation of our soul. I really appreciated Jay Leno for some of the things he did when he was uh, host of the Tonight Show several years ago. One of the things he would do was go out on the streets of New York City and he would do what he called a man on the street interview. And he asked several times, he asked questions concerning the Bible. Not about religion in general, but concerning scripture. He said to a guy out on the streets of New York one night, he said, complete this phrase from scripture he that is without sin among you and the guy said let him have a good time that's what he thought the bible said and it, it, some of the things that people would say in an answer to what leno was asking them about the bible clearly show that most people really don't have a clue what god says about human relationships what scripture says about anything it's amazing Kate Millett, in her book, Sexual Politics, says, the family must go. It is the family that has oppressed and enslaved women for so many years. The best thing society could do, says uh, David Cooper in his book, The Death of the Family, the best thing society could do is to abolish the family altogether. He says in another place, the family destroys the sexual and social independence of the individual. Gloria Steinem said, the surest way to be alone is to get married. Which may be true if you married her, I don't know. <laughs> God says in Genesis 2 and 18, it is not good for a man to be alone. I will make him a help suitable for him. And I think when you do a little study on those Hebrew words, you're going to find out that God is saying, I am going to make the absolute perfect relationship here between a man and a woman. She will be compatible to him in every way. There is no way that anyone would be able to improve upon what God made there. In Ephesians chapter 5, the Bible raises marriage to the level of God's relationship with us. No higher comparison could be made, and there is no other comparison that could be made that could show the beauty and the integrity of marriage as God has made it. And the Old Testament does that too in many places. In Psalm 11 and verse 3, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? We quote that verse so often, we may forget the context. But in the very next verse, verse 4, it says God is in his holy temple. And the point that is being made in, in that psalm is that God sees what people are doing to the foundations of society. God sees. He knows. What can the righteous do? I'll tell you what the righteous can do. We can continue to seek and search out and pursue righteousness. That's what we can continue to do. And as Tack emphasized so strongly in the previous hour, unless the Lord builds the house, you are wasting your time in trying to build it. There's this growing obsession with radical individualism in our country. Lagarde Smith sums it all up. Everything I'll say this morning could probably be summed up in a statement that he makes in his book, When Choice Becomes God. He said, if once we were a nation under God, we are rapidly becoming a nation under self. 
God loses out in a nation obsessed with individual rights. Individualism is strongly rooted in liberalism as a philosophy. Again, please read the lecture. I know that you'll read all the lectures in the book and you'll see some history on all of this, especially as it relates to our nation. But historically, the essence of liberalism was the toleration of different beliefs and different ideas. Not a bad thing. It's at the taproot of our nation. It was originally a means of combating the might-makes-right form of government leadership. Our American Declaration of Independence includes words to that effect. All men are created equal. We are endowed by our Creator with certain unalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that to ensure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their powers from the content or consent, rather, of the governed. That was a good move. We would say, as Americans today, we see a shift in different directions today. But that was a shift in the right direction. But time, the passing of time, and this part of human nature that can be so selfish and so self-absorbed have a way of turning all of that on its head. And I think in the last few decades you'll agree with me when I say that we have seen our constitutional privileges turned upside down and reinterpreted to mean that any individual has the right to live as they please without any outdated rules or restrictions that would be imposed by some other individual. And tolerance has evolved into this individualistic me, me, me philosophy. Smith says in another place, God loses out in a nation obsessed with individual rights. God appears to be more about responsibilities than rights, more about duties than privileges. Not an exciting prospect when we are accustomed to gorging ourselves on a daily diet of unrestrained liberty come license. How foreign are David's words to our society's penchant for blaming others when things go wrong. David said in Psalm 51 verses 3 and 4, for I know my transgression and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done what is evil in thy sight. David is not ignoring the suffering that he had caused Bathsheba and her husband Uriah when he says that his sin was against God. He is acknowledging that the misuse of his personal privileges that were given to him by God, the accompanying power as king that was given to him by God, that the misuse of that resulted in a real sense of shame toward the one who made him. That's what David is saying. Wouldn't you love to hear that? On TV, the daily news sometime. David knew that without the right relationship with his maker and provider, he could not be the kind of influence on others that he should be. And that he would be powerless to do so until he was honest with God. His hypocrisy was personal. David knew, I've got to deal with this. Wouldn't you love to hear that on CNN sometime later today? But we don't hear those kinds of things. And our culture has traveled light years from David's biblical model of leadership and service to others and what we hear from politicians and religious leaders today. And when they get themselves in a tight spot is, how can I get out of this mess and still keep the position and the power that I occupy and have? And it's killing us.
Throughout history, there have been so many isms. You can read and study about that. I want to mention just two very briefly. Humanism. 21st century humanism strongly endorses human rights, including reproductive rights, gender equality, social injustice, separation of church and state, and a host of other rights that directly affect our marriages and our family. You know that. But it sure enough does remind me of the days of the judges where in those days everyone was doing what was right in his own eyes. Judges 21 verse 25. And the other is hedonism. Hedonism. Which argues that pleasure is the only intrinsic good and pain is the only intrinsic bad or evil. And accordingly, what we should do as human beings is always seek those things in life that lead us to a greater balance of pleasure over pain. Anne Wren, in her book, Atlas Shrug, nails it down as well as it can be nailed down by any of these people that believe in this. She emphatically argues that the purpose of morality, she said, and I quote, the purpose of morality is to teach you not how to suffer and die, but how to enjoy yourself and live. Listen, God in his word teaches us how to enjoy ourselves and live and how to suffer and die with grace and integrity. God gives it all to us. We need to know how to suffer. And we need to know how to reach the end of the road and die because that's a part of life. But in this me, me, me society we live in, you just want to be happy. Do what makes you happy. And it's unfortunate because that kind of happiness is a God that will never, ever be satisfied. Remember, you are not your own, for you have been bought with a price. A lot of people have said we live in a throwaway society, and I, I agree with that. I think that we do. There was a lady who was standing on a second floor balcony and she was looking out and she slipped somehow and lost her footing and she fell off the balcony and she landed in the back of a slow moving dump truck. And there she is in all this litter trying in vain to get the attention of the driver, you know. And there's a guy on the street corner that's watching all of this unfold. He's not an American. He's a visitor from a European country. And he's watching this, and he's muttering to himself. He says, ah, what a prime example of American wastefulness. That woman looks like she has a good 10 years left in her. <laughs> now, that's our reputation. We had some sisters from Russia come and stay with us for a couple of weeks one time years ago and when they left I was embarrassed at how much we had and how wasteful we are with what we have and they had so little. We live in a throwaway society. Wasn't that way when I was growing up too much. You had to clean it, repair it, and refurbish it and keep it maybe for the rest of your life being raised by people that had lived through the Great Depression, but we live in a throwaway society today. Everything is disposable. And unfortunately, along with our penchant for throwing away things, we are cultivating the habit of throwing away moral anchors. And we even throw away people and relationships. A marriage can be thrown away because a husband is not as attentive as his wife feels that he should be. Another marriage is trashed because a wife is not as young and pretty as she once was. And on and on we go. And if you're unhappy with your marriage today, get a divorce and make a change. If your kids no longer bring you personal satisfaction, throw away your parental responsibilities, work longer hours and go home and follow the work day with alcohol and or drugs. Find your happiness because, man, it's all about you. 
It's sad, isn't it? But that's the philosophy and the doctrine that we are overwhelmed with in our world today. And I really think that the road to nationwide acceptance of homosexual unions in our world today is paved with throwaway heterosexual marriages. The argument for the same-sex marriage has shifted from gender to monogamy. And what I mean by that is that a same-sex monogamous relationship is now being viewed as more moral than all the rampant infidelity that characterizes so many heterosexual marriages. And I don't blame the gay community for making that argument. It's wrong. And two wrongs will never make a right. But look at what has happened in American society because of what has happened to marriage. And the heterosexual counter-revolution to the gay movement is articulated as a need to return to traditional marriage. And you got to appreciate the fact that there are some people in our country that want us to go back to one man and one woman. But listen, there are a lot of things in traditional marriage that do not honor God. And that certainly are not equal to what the Bible says about marriage. What we really need in our society is a restoration movement. We need to recover biblical marriage. Jay Adams says, marriage wasn't devised by man somewhere along the way in the course of human history as a convenient way of sorting out responsibilities for children, etc. Instead, God tells us that he himself established, instituted, and ordained marriage at the beginning of human history. If marriage were of human origin, then human beings would have the right to decide when a marriage begins and how it should be regulated. But of course, marriage is not of human origin. Neither a private individual or the state has the right or the competence to decide who may be married or divorced and on what basis. Only God has that right. God help us to keep teaching this and enable hopefully more people in our society to realize that it's, it's right, it's correct. Our maker alone has that right. Been a lot of damage done to biblical marriage through uh, denominational teaching and Roman Catholic theology and a lot of Protestant and Calvinistic theology. things that we have to counter in our dealing with people in our society today. But the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 2 verses 16 and 17 that marriage is about companionship. Marriage is all about companionship. And the term that is used in the Hebrew conveys the idea of close warm, intimate relationship with another person. An antonym of companion is stranger. And what God is really saying in Proverbs 2, if you look it up and spend a little time with it, is that this woman that he's describing there has left the companion of her youth and now she is going out and she is seeking other people. And that word companion is just filled with the idea of selflessness. Everything about it has to do with selflessness. Individualism has no place in a marriage. It runs counter in every way to the marriage as God has designed it. A companion is one with whom you are intimately united in your thoughts, in your goals, in your plans, in your efforts and also in our bodies. It is not possible to be in an intimate union while thinking only of one's personal interests. 
Marriage is God's cure for aloneness and loneliness. And you know, it's a shame that there are so many people who are in a marriage relationship that when they feel alone or lonely for whatever reason, the very first thing they do is to look for someone else. And they attach themselves to someone else and maybe after that someone else and they find in the end that they have brought great pain upon themselves. In this me, 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 I want it all generation, it is so hard to convince any of us that we've got to think about the other person over and above ourselves. In Ezekiel 16 and verse 8, the Lord uses terms like I swore to you and I entered into a covenant with you. And the analogy that is being made there is once again between God's relationship with his people and a relationship between a man and a woman in marriage. Husbands, love your wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. And he who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, Ephesians 5, 25 through 28. Seems to be an inspired commentary on the one flesh that Christ talked about in Matthew 19 and verse 5. We live in a selfie world, and we have to find our way to God, his word, and the blessings that he has for us in our marriages. I'll close with this statement, brethren. Individualism is a thief. Individualism causes a spiritual myopia that will blind us to our full potential as people, as God has created us in his image. The greatest accomplishments throughout history have been made by selfless souls who have seen others as more important than self. Self-centeredness will always leave us empty in the end, but the Spirit of Christ will fill us to the brim with real satisfaction and fulfillment. God be praised because of his glorious word that leads us away from self and into the lives of others and into the life of Christ and the blessings that he has for us as his people. Enjoy the day and enjoy yourself here at lectures this week. Thank you so much for being here today.